So we're just making our way into the Mexico Anthropology Museum here in the center of Mexico City. We're mainly here to see Olmec artifacts, pieces, as well as some other pieces of interest that you'll find fascinating, including some elongated skulls, amongst other things. So let's get in and have a look. So this is Monument 2 from San Lorenzo, one of the classic Olmec heads, one of about 10 that were found there. Uh, it weighs at least 20 tons. The heaviest Olmec head is 40 tons, which is found in the region of uh, near Trascipotes, um, not at the site itself, but nearby. Um, but you can see this is badly weathered. Uh, this was found again buried in the ground, decommissioned. It's been deliberately damaged as well. Uh, but as we'll see as we move through the Olmec world, there's many more of these with much more detail. And these clearly show individuals. They're not just representations of like gods or anything like that. They're actual individual rulers from this part of the world. If we look around the side here, you can see the huge kind of earrings, and the, the helmet that's on it and the kind of ears. It's amazing. So, uh, so 17 of these have been found officially. 17. 17. The latest one was um, in, the, I think, the 1990s, early 90s. This was uh, in San Lorenzo. Where one of the lady female archaeologists was going through some of the swamps and lakes, and this one of them, not this one here, was facing up from the lake, and it kind of terrified her when she saw it. Uh, but that one's still at San Lorenzo itself, so we won't be seeing that, uh, unfortunately. But these, this one's from San Lorenzo. There's another one over here we're going to look at. And the other thing about these is that most of these were found buried at the sites. They were not found like this, standing upright. They were found buried. They were deliberately buried. Some of them were deliberately damaged. Like you can see these sort of uh, marks here. And um, so people think that they were sort of decommissioned. Another culture came in and kind of they dispersed and died out. Um, but the influences of the Olmec go all the way past Mexico City to a place called Chalcatzingo. We went there a couple of years ago. There's also potential evidence of them even being involved possibly in places like Teotihuacan in the early phases of that at the very end of the Olmec era. So here we have the ceramic pipes that were used as aqueducts from San Lorenzo, suggesting that not only were they using water, but according to John Burke and Kaj Halberg, they were actually harnessing, moving water quickly through the site to actually uh, create kind of electric charge and energy, which is a, a fascinating idea and probably got some truth in it. We know also that they were one of the earliest people to use uh, magnets, uh, even earlier than the Chinese. So there's even one theory that, because the, it looks like there were Chinese here, there were possibly Africans, we're not sure about all this, this is all vague uh, prehistory. Um, so they may have even influenced the Chinese, because they found jade here, which is the same style as the Chinese. There's so much, so much uh, more to say about this, but the Olmec era is between pretty much 1800 BC probably the, the, the real peak of it was probably 1200 or 1400 they really started dying out around probably 400. 600 bc yeah. onwards and they kind of like you know went into other cultures and things like this there's many many sites san lorenzo was the capital the venta was is the only one left really with pyramids still there uh, which we're going to see um, but there are multiple other ones but there's nothing left of them because they built it was such a um, it's such humid climate, everything kind of gets destroyed. They used earth to build many of their sites. Mm -hmm. Not so much stone, but quite a lot of stone. But the stonework is so good. It's so well done. And it's, you know, it's, it's higher quality that, and better quality than the Maya and the Aztec later. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real question mark. They suddenly emerged, 1800 BC, intact. They had a high level sophistication of stonework. They were moving these heads, as Omar said, uh, 60 kilometers from the Tuxla mountain range. This across, yeah, across swamps, mm -hmm. across rivers, 
and it's really marshy land and, and they were somehow doing it and there was even a BBC documentary that was made about 10 years ago where they tried to move the stones, carve the stones, totally failed. And these <laughs> academics from universities failed to do what the Olmecs could do almost uh, you know, 3,000 years ago. Um, and so yeah, I mean you just have a look around, you can just see some of the quality of the stonework here is just remarkable. And the other thing about these heads, which I forgot to mention, often at the temple, on either side or one side of them, uh, they, you have a magnetic fluctuation. And so that they were working with magnetism, we know that for sure, because uh, we know that they're often built their sites upon magnetic anomalies. They often, uh, you know, we know that they had a kind of, they were the, one of the first compasses was invented at 1200 BC. And, uh, and if you actually do an analysis and a magnetic analysis of the stones, you find them in the temples over here. You know, it's really bizarre. And, uh, and there's more carvings all around the back as well. Yeah, you can't really see too much on here. Uh, but often they have braids and feathers coming down the back. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. so there's one, with, one of them we'll see has seven braids on the back. It's a Halapa Museum. And you can see the flat back of it as well is uh, potentially a representation of cranial deformation. This was found in San Lorenzo, supposedly a representation of a great fish with a cross in the center of it. So this artifact here, it was found at San Lorenzo in Veracruz, and it's Olmec, and we can tell this easily by the big cruciform or the X cross here, which represents the sacred fire. But this Monument 58 is a fish deity. Now, it has anthropomorphic features. We see the human nose here, and of course, the fin here, and it, we know it is a deity because of this X, which the Olmecs generally always placed on or near their deities. Now, I have a theory about this. Their supreme deity, I believe, was Quetzalcoatl, which is represented on Monument 19. But I think that all of these other aspects, such as the fish, the fin here, are simply pieces of Quetzalcoatl. These are representations of him showing his power, for example, under the water. And when he is shown with a bird imagery, it's the air or a serpent. It's the water and the earth. And the jaguar itself represents solidly the earth. So we have all of these very confusing images relating to the Olmec pantheon, which have not been sorted out yet. But I think if we focus on Quetzalcoatl and these simply being aspects of him, it'll become much easier. So this is a stella from a place called Alvarado in Veracruz State. Again, it's clearly Olmec, with Olmec figurines and carvings all over it. What's happened to the rest of the site is unclear, but we're gonna check this out when we visit the Olmec world. But you can see the carvings all over it clearly have Olmec features. And then we have, what we often find with the adult and then the child uh, down below, cross-legged and sitting on the ground. And even down here, we have some interesting symbolism, a triangular, features with a solar symbol. This is a discovery made at Lachoa Pass, which again is in Veracruz state. You can see, clearly see this some kind of strange figure with almost antennas coming out of his helmet and with his crossed arms looking fairly intense. Again, this has got the classic Olmec features, including what looks like an Olmec hat. So this is Monument 12 from Leventa. And this is some kind of strange looking gentleman with uh, almost like a weird Jaguar features. Interestingly, his arms appear to be going up behind his head, like he's doing some kind of pose, whether it's some kind of spiritual pose or it's some kind of yoga, which has been 
uh, theorized by various researchers is unclear. His name is El Mono, and uh, you can clearly see he's got a very large skull, very large head, and he's got the weird jaguar features going around the head and around the eyebrows, which is something we find in this part of the world. On the lips, it's very interesting. It almost looks like he's got some kind of moustache, which shouldn't really be for people from this part of uh, Mexico. This is, this is like one of the most important ones, really. Um, you can see it's got some kind of gentleman here. Some people compare it to the great lid of Palenque as well. He's in some kind of machine or rocket. But it's, it looks like he's carrying some kind of man bag, which Jim's no doubt going to want to talk about. Um, <laughs> he likes his man bags. Uh, and JJ's been researching that as well. But you can see like we've got like a plume serpent here, which is like the earliest representation known potentially of Quetzalcoatl or Cuckoo Clan or the Plume Serpent. Uh, but he's kind of surrounding him and he's sitting inside it. It almost looks like he's in, in some kind of machine. Classic image of the serpent, the Plume Serpent engulfing a gentleman who's holding some kind of bag in his hand. He's got something on his nose which could be some kind of breathing apparatus and even what looks like, according to some researchers, some kind of helmet. And you can see he's holding something else, like a lever or something in his left hand, and the serpent continues underneath him. So this could be highly symbolic, or it could have some other meaning. But it could, as well, be the first known representation of the plume serpent, which is what we see here. So this is absolutely fascinating. And then we have the symbolism, of the double cross there as well. The man bag, which has got many different uh, stories associated with it, found in different parts of the world, like Sumeria, and uh, even Gebekli Tepe, according to some people. And uh, it's from about 1300 BC. Absolutely stunning piece of relief carving in basalt. Um, there's layered imagery on here. You'll notice that the man is inside this creature. It's a bird. Mm -hmm. okay. And then he has a fin right here. Mm -hmm. So the fish going back to mm -hmm. that symbol. And also the serpent. And it's really prominent with um, these kind of artifacts. Just pay attention to the details. And I always find something new every time I look. So that is what excites me. So this is one of the, the crouched, kind of weird jaguars. This one was found in San Lorenzo. It's got all the classic features. It's almost like an anamorph, kind of shamanic figure, mixed between a human and a jaguar. Um, and you see the kind of cleft lip. Um, you see the indentation in the skull, or the cleft skull. This is often actually uh, what we find in some of the skulls, which for a certain type of cranial deformation actually pushes in the center there, so it comes out bigger here. And so that representation is very interesting. We find it on this particular statue. This one was found at uh, San Lorenzo. It's made clearly of basalt. It's got all the classic features of the Olmec heads. 17 of these have been found in total, of course. You can even see the eyes, and they're slightly crossed in this, on this one, and the kind of cleft upper lip here. So this is a brilliant example of one of the 17 Olmec heads um, found um, in the Olmec realm of the Gulf Coast. About 10 were found at San Lorenzo, so it's great to have two on display here at the Archaeology Museum in Mexico City. I love these sort of uh, these hats they're wearing. They look like they're kind of leather, but when, when I was actually in uh, Colombia, I went to the Gold Museum in Bogota, and there was one identical to this. And I was like, what? So they could have been gold hats they were wearing. Uh, yeah. uh, gold, sort of almost like um, um, <laughs> crowns, even, of some sort. So we're just around the back of one of the old Mac heads here in the museum to get some light on the subject, see what we can see. Uh, there's not too much going on in the back here. We can see the way the kind of hat comes round, goes across the back there. Not too much going on. 
Yeah, it's interesting just to check what's happening back here. Is there anything else we can have a look at? Not really. A few chips and carvings. We can see the kind of circular indentation up there. Very interesting. What's interesting about this one as well is the fact that we see the kind of frown look here, uh, right in the center here. And you can also notice that the eyes kind of look inwards. So it's almost like cross eyes. So whether that's like a representation of something, we don't know. It's got the, the classic helmet on. And also we can see that it's got spirals up on top here and certain iconography uh, all over here, which almost looks Mayan in fact. Um, but this really is a really good piece. They've really lit it well. Interestingly, it's got a dimple in the nose there. So whether that was part of the original design, we don't know. But the lip here is much like we find on the Ramesses statues in Egypt, where clearly it's kind of like sticking out a little bit. So whether that uh, was done on purpose, or whether it was part of the design, we don't know. But you can see like little cut marks have been sort of dug into it. And clearly this was found buried, it had been decommissioned and forgotten about until the 1950s when they were rediscovered by Matthew Sterling and his team. So this piece was found at San Lorenzo. Again, it looks like some kind of warrior or someone who's potentially a wrestler because of the kind of pants he's wearing. As you can see over there, we have the famous wrestler statue found in the Veracruz area, but this has got the arms missing, but he's got some kind of harness on his back, which is very bizarre. But it's almost like his feet are going up behind him, like a kind of yoga position. Very strange piece of Olmec art. So this is the wrestler who was found in Veracruz and a kind of site that's now completely disappeared. But you can see he's pulling some kind of pose. It's very well carved. It's almost like a yoga pose, in fact. And he's got the flattened back of the head, which is reminiscent of what we find in the larger colossal Olmec heads. But look, he's also got facial hair. He's clearly got a beard and a moustache. Suggest, suggesting that maybe he didn't come from this area. In fact, if you look at the features, he looks extremely oriental. So this is another mystery we have with the Olmecs. Where did they really come from? Yeah. So these are strange Olmec figures that we find, um, you know, from the er some of the earliest phases of uh, the Olmec world, where they're clearly trying to show you their parts, but there's no parts there to see. So this is some kind of androgynous, or it could even be eunuchs, which is what another theory has been put forward. And down here, we have what looks like a fertility goddess, with very slanted eyes and a big belly and strong thighs. So there's a lot of debate about this, but we know that they were very much focused on fertility of the land, fertility of themselves. Um, which is something that's been proven over and over again with the earth energies and the technologies evident at their sites. Here we have some ceramics here. These look like uh, pieces of corn from the Olmec world. And other pieces here, the sort of cross shape. And some interesting pieces here, again, showing actually uh, their parts off again. And then we have this guy, he looks like he's got some kind of elongated head and a helmet on, which could be the helmets they wear, the, the great Olmec heads, could actually be to elongate their skulls. So then we have down here, very, very oriental features, almost like from Vietnam or somewhere. So it's very intriguing, the more you look into these particular cultures around the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So these wooden figures, very rare, with very elongated skulls, were found at a site called El Manati in Veracruz. Now these date back to at least 1000 BC. Hard to see through the glass here, but let's get some extreme close-ups and you can just see some of the detail. How these got preserved, I don't know. They must have been buried in an air-tight area. And you can just see 
elongation or at least the representation of the elongation of the skull and the cleft lip. Classic Olmec features. So here we have two of the most important Olmec pieces that show evidence of the calendrics they were using going back into the deep prehistory. First up, we have the Tuxla statuette, which was found in 1902 in the area of La Majora. Um, it was then smuggled over to North America, and eventually found in a box of tobacco leaf and then given to the Smithsonian Institution. And it consists of 75 epi Olmec glyphs from at least 500 BC to 500 AD. And the date on it is very interesting. It's 162 AD is one of the dates of the long count calendar that was decoded from it. It's made of jadeite. It was uh, found in the, you know, we know it's found near La Majora in the Tuxla Mountains, which is where the quarry site is for most of the Olmec heads. And so it's a fascinating piece. Well, this is one of the earliest pieces that actually depicts and represents that calendar, so proving that it wasn't the Mayans who invented the long count calendar, which everybody thinks. And we've got even more evidence here. This is from Tres Zapotes, this one. This is from, uh, this is another Olmec site. Uh, which is uh, pre pretty much mostly destroyed. Um, and you can actually see the bar and dot system, yeah. which is what, what we find in the classic long count calendar of the Maya. Mm -hmm. And this was found in the early 1950s by uh, Matthew Sterling. He was uh, the Smithsonian archaeologist <coughs> who did all the excavation found, and he was the one who really pushed forward to prove that there was a pre-Mayan civilization, because the other academics wouldn't believe him or wouldn't have it. And so when they found this, they thought, well, this is strange, because they thought it originally it was a Mayan piece because it had Mayan glyphs on, but when they did all the carbon dating, it went back to like something like 14, 1500 BC. Um, and so the dates on here are really interesting. Um, this, this one's 32 BC, and when they found the other part, uh, his wife actually found the other part to this, which is uh, uh, currently in the museum at Trezapotes. They actually confirmed the date, so they were looking at a date long before the Maya, even older than the Tuxla statuette. There's been other pieces found as well, which I'll talk about another day, but this really was the smoke and gun of like where the calendar came from and who could have invented it, and it was most certainly the Olmec by the looks of it. And so it's just absolutely mind-blowing that we find these pieces both on display in the Mexico National Museum here in Mexico City. So this was found at Tres Zapotes, the classic Olmec site, and you can see the beautiful, what looks like spiral carvings, but they could in fact represent the serpent because we have plumes coming off them. So again, this could be a kind of more abstract form of the plume serpent represented on this particular kind of large bowl, it almost looks like some kind of burial cyst. You can see further examples as we look around this side as well. And all up the top here. And here we have what looks like some kind of bird creature. Or it could even be the face of something else, like a weird jaguar. But it's so intricate and so beautifully done. It's really difficult to tell what's going on here. But these spirals do suggest that it could be a connection with other cultures around the world, or it could simply be a representation of the Telluric Earth energies we know that they could work with and manipulate. So this was clearly a very important person, a representation of them uh, from San Lorenzo. Uh, this is uh, Monument 6 and you can clearly see the headgear is either what's creating the elongated skull, it's cranial deformation uh, tools, or it could be, it looks like some kind of turban which is very similar in design as to what we see in Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in the statues there. And so the fact that we're finding this in the Olmec world is absolutely fascinating. So this is really well carved, it's quite damaged, but you can see that the shape of the skull, again, is very flat at the back, which is what we find on the large, colossal Olmec heads. And we have like earrings, we have um, like a cleft lip as well, which is what we find on many of the larger heads. And, but it's quite a thin face, it looks like a younger person. So these are the jadeite pieces of what looks like a selection of people with elongated skulls and very oriental features, all in some kind of meeting or ceremony. 
with uh, jadeite columns behind them. And these were found in situ, in the ground, in Laventa, buried right beneath the main plaza area, where in fact there are massive basalt columns. So these could be representations of the basalt columns that were actually there and the people meeting or doing some ceremony there. So it's fascinating that this was found buried in the ground in this exact configuration and only rediscovered much, much later, suggesting they were wanted to like preserve a kind of memory of something very important that took place at some time in the distant past at Laventa. Uh, and you can clearly see the feet, these are all made of jade. These were found buried within the center of the site, in the most energetic part of the site, right next to a magnetic anomaly. Mm. It's all jade. I mean, they've actually got carvings on if you look carefully. You can actually see the different carvings on it. They, they made all these layers of these huge mosaics going deep into the ground with all these different materials between them. And it's utterly bizarre why they would do that. And they could then deliberately bury them up immediately. So they, so they were burying things in the ground and then and covering them up so you can't see them at all. And yet it took years to make them. I know outside here, we can see a classic Olmec uh, tomb. Uh, this is a reconstruction made of fiberglass. Uh, and these were actually buried in the ground at places like Levanto and other sites. And so, uh, I mean, I find that really intriguing. They were using huge basalt columns from the Tuxla Mountains, 60 or so kilometers away. So here we have one of the basalt column burial places of the Olmecs. Now this one is recreated from Laventa. And you can see this unique style of construction where they were using these naturally formed basalt columns to create this absolutely stunning burial chamber. Now these were buried in the ground, remember. These were not on top of the surface like we see here, these were buried under the ground, covered up completely, much like dolmens or long barrows in ancient Britain. And whether they've actually put anything inside it, I don't know, no, I haven't. But you can just see inside it there what it would have been like to be buried in one of these. This is not small, it's the huge amount of effort to bring all these stones, this bas massive basalt columns from the Tuxla Mountains, at least 50, 40 or 50 miles away from Leventa. And you can just see that there, isn't that amazing? Now I'm hopefully gonna be going to Leventa on this trip. We've been there several times before. Um, many of these columns are still there. You can actually still see them in situ. This is called Hombre Tiger. This is from 1200. BC from Arroyo Sonso, which is about a quarter of a kilometer from Puerto Mexico in the Veracruz area. Now this is a very, very strange animal figure. It looks more like an elephant than a tiger. You can see the crouching quizzo position, the strange skull. Absolutely amazing. It's very really alien looking. Well, you see this uh, seating position there on the one on the le one on the left. That's called the quizzo position, and that's uh, for some reason that's found all over the Olmec lab. But it's also found at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. It's found all throughout the Pacific. It's found in uh, different parts of Mexico and all around the world. And it's like this sort of posture, like a meditation posture that seems to be all over the world in like, extremely ancient cultures. So, what, what is that all about? Something David Childress has written about, and others. This was found at Porto Nuevo in Veracruz. It dates to 1800 to 100 BC. And it was found in 1946. It's clearly a serpent. You must remember that Porto Nuevo is where they found these, the kind of statue with the Atlantean Olmec dwarfs holding up the world. So this is the site we're gonna try and find on a, on a visit to the Veracruz uh, Gulf Coast area. This is just interesting, so it's definitely an Olmec piece. It's very abstract, much like most of their art. And it's found at a definite Olmec site. There are a couple of um, wheeled toys from Tres Zapotes on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, a classic Olmec site, dated from about 1400 BC to about 1000 BC. And you can clearly see these have wheels in their design, but technically, 
there were no wheels in the Olmec Mayan or any other part of the world at this kind of time. So this is very, very intriguing that although officially they didn't use the wheel to like move around or construct the sites or transport or anything like that, but they used them on their toys for children to play with. So another anomaly of the Olmecs. The little figurine here is an example of um, the Olmec version of Bess, uh, the globally known deity. And um, you, it, it's prominent because of the wide face, the beard. He was usually a protector of women in childbirth. So it's really amazing that they have this here. And this gentleman here clearly has a moustache and beard and got features that could even it's be very European. Yes, it could be like, you know, it could be Phoenician. It could be like uh, the first travelers coming over to this part of the world, which were then evidenced clearly at, at Cobalcalco. In the Olmec world, they've got lots and lots of representations of elongated skulls, flattening the back of the head, the cleft skull in the middle, which mm -hmm. pushed down and expanded at the side. Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, because of the, t the climate there, every piece of bone has been pretty much destroyed so yeah, there's, there's, there's not yeah there's not much evidence to go on from so there can't be any dna tests no skeletons of the olmecs have ever been found but we will see mm -hmm. some skulls at the halapa museum as well which are really good examples of cranial deformation um also trepanning and things like this so here we have examples of cranial deformation and how it was done with this clay statuette from the gulf coast area now this is a bit later than the olmecs but they give you gives you an example of how the Olmecs would have influenced the later Gulf Coast cultures. You can see that here, the shaping of the skull, the one at the back there. It's got a very flat back of the head, very much an Olmec tradition. We have this one down here as well, a very flat back of the skull. And you know, all found on the Gulf, Ke Gulf Coast region. So we complete our trip through the Mexico City Anthropology Museum. We hope you enjoyed your journey with us and please subscribe, check out more Megalithomania videos and we'll see you next time.